tonight on Nova. Sigmund Freud revolutionized our thinking about the human mind. But who was this man? And how do his theories hold up today? Freud really believed that he had come upon certain insights about the way the mind works that he regarded as remarkable and quite original. Mind you, he did have insight. But if you ask in strict scientific terms, I'd be very surprised if much of it survives. Tonight on NOAA, Freud Under Analysis. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Additional funding was provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And by Allied Signal, a technology leader in aerospace, electronics, automotive products, and engineered materials. Sigmund Freud is heralded as one of the great thinkers of the 20th century, famous for his ideas on dreams, childhood sexuality, and the role of the unconscious. Freud saw himself as a scientist who had discovered a method of understanding the mysteries of the mind, which he called psychoanalysis. But how scientific is psychoanalysis? And how well do Freud's ideas stand up to our modern understanding of the mind? Freud revolutionized the way we think about ourselves, but today there is a widening gap between the popular and the scientific views of Freud. We live clearly in a Freudian world, and it is quite unthinkable to envision the world without his language, without his ideas, however well or ill they are expressed. There's no doubt that his, his ideas appealed to the imagination of the time, partly because they are revolutionary and partly because they seem to fit into the general way of thinking. And so they had a very large cultural impact, and yet the probability is that they won't be correct. The Freudian revolution began here in Vienna. These films, taken in the late 1920s, show Freud's followers. They came from all over the world to the city that was known as the center of psychoanalysis. Some were physicians like Freud, others were intellectuals drawn to Vienna by the excitement of being part of a new movement. But most came to learn Freud's radical new form of treatment. They entered his famous consulting rooms at Berggasse 19 in the hopes of undergoing a training analysis with the master himself. When these films were taken, Freud was in his 70s. His daughter, Anna, herself an analyst, was a constant companion. Psychoanalysis was Freud's passion. During the day, he saw patients. At night, he spent hours reading or writing. He was tireless in his devotion to what he called his new science. His ideas were so powerful, so potent, that they have dramatically influenced almost every discipline, including literature, art, and medicine. But the Freudian legacy is a complicated one. Although he wanted psychoanalysis to stand on its own as a science, it is known today mainly as a form of therapy. As a young doctor in the 1930s, Joseph Wirtis traveled to Vienna to undergo a training analysis with Freud. Now a psychiatrist at the State University of New York, Dr. Wirtis describes his first session. I was rather surprised at his uh, physical appearance. Uh, he was then uh, well uh, into his uh, 70s, and he was, uh, looked extremely small and, uh, and frail, and at the same time, uh, quite energetic. He spoke in a vigorous uh, sort of uh, professorial uh, style, uh, clipping his, uh, his uh, syllables. And uh, he uh, uh, was direct and to the point. Uh, he said he would be glad to take me on. He stated his fee, which would be uh, uh, the equivalent of 20 
dollars an hour, which uh, seems very little nowadays, but in those days in Vienna it was a substantial fee. And uh, he said uh, my uh, responsibilities uh, would be uh, simply to uh, expose uh, my thoughts, uh, my uh, feelings, uh, to be uh, candid, uh, to uh, discuss my uh, dreams. And uh, he did not uh, set a specific goal. I think his assumption was that in time, uh, material would turn up which uh, he would interpret or, as he would say, bring to consciousness. And uh, that's how the uh, analytic uh, uh, process would uh, unfold. Uh, I would come in and say, uh, Herr Professor, I had some really uh, good uh, dreams last night. And he would say, fine, uh, let's uh, talk about them. And uh, he would, uh, you know, uh, approach them uh, with a real interest and, and zest. And if I was able to pitch in uh, with some uh, interpretations that he liked, uh, he would say this was, this was a very good session. On the other hand, if I uh, was skeptical and uh, resistant, uh, he would uh, show his, uh, his disappointment and sometimes his irritation uh, in no uh, uncertain uh, way. And uh, he would say, you have no right to be skeptical. He said, first, you should learn about the analysis. When the Freud Museum opened in London in the summer of 1986, many of Freud's followers, those who did learn about the analysis, gathered to pay tribute. Among them was an historian from Yale University, Professor Peter Gay, the author of a new biography of Freud. The museum is in the house where Freud lived the last year of his life after having fled Vienna during the Nazi occupation. He brought with him many of his prized possessions, his writing desk, his collection of antiquities, and the famous couch. Professor Peter Gay. As you look around his study and uh, above all in his consulting room, you can see he had really two passions and they blend into one. One was psychology, he said, I have a tyrant, psychology, and he welcomed that tyrant. And the other was, of course, collecting antiquities, which um, he collected avidly as soon as he could afford, afford them, which was from the uh, late 1880s on. Freud said, these are characteristic of what I do. I, too, am an archaeologist. I like to dig, and what I dig at, uh, of course, and dig into is the human mind. And that metaphor of uh, digging uh, as an ar archaeologist, whether it is finding those treasures or digging in, uh, into ancient Rome, as he says in one of his uh, books, does bring this together. And his own sense was that this collecting took him back to a kind of childhood of humanity, as he uh, once said. And this is, of course, very close to the work that he was doing when he sat in his chair analyzing patients, going back to their childhood as well. Vienna at the turn of the century was a city of contradictions. It was dominated by the Victorian ethic of strict morality. At the same time, it was also a city excited by new ideas coming from a vibrant artistic and intellectual community. But Freud's Vienna was a world of science and medicine. His friends were doctors. His education, his medical education, was crucial for him, uh, much more important, I think, than uh, it might be for any ordinary physician, because he absorbed with it not merely medical knowledge, of, of which he had a great deal and which he used in a kind of uh, as a psychologist rather than uh, as a doctor, but also a philosophy, a view of the world, a completely secular, materialistic view into which he uh, fitted his psychology. Freud distinguished himself academically at a very young age. He was a prolific writer and an avid reader in the arts, humanities, and sciences. He attended the University of Vienna to study medicine, one of the few professions with opportunities for a young Jewish man. Freud was schooled in the scientific methods of the 19th century laboratory, which stressed the importance of experimentation, observation, and measurement. He became an expert in neurology. These drawings illustrate his interest in the brain and nervous system. His experiments with nerve cells led him to invent a new method of dyeing tissue samples for study. Freud also experimented with cocaine. He used it himself for at least 10 years. He was enthusiastic about its therapeutic properties and speculated on its potential as an anesthetic for the eye, publishing several papers, including On Cocaine. <laughs> 
During these years, he was greatly influenced by his university professors, especially Ernst von Brücke, an adherent of the Helmholtz School of Thought, scientists who believed that everything was reducible to chemical and physical forces. In the scientific mind of the 19th century, all phenomena could be logically understood. But Freud, now 30 years old and engaged to be married, was warned by his teachers that he would never make enough money as a researcher. They encouraged him to work with patients and open a private practice. For several years, Freud worked in psychiatric hospitals and clinics. As his practice grew, he became interested in hysteria, a nervous disorder in which patients experience physical symptoms but have no underlying physical disease. He began using a new, controversial technique, hypnosis. Discouraged with the results, however, he turned to his colleague and close friend, Josef Breuer, for advice. As Freud later described, it was from these conversations that psychoanalysis began to take form. For some time, when he was asked who was the founder of psychoanalysis, he would not say, I am the founder, but rather he would use his friend and collaborator, a somewhat older Viennese physician, uh, uh, Josef Breuer, because Breuer had told him the story of one of his, of Breuer's patients. The stories of uh, a young, intelligent, uh, well-educated woman who develops all kinds of bizarre psychological symptoms. She forgets her German, for example. She uh, finds herself unable to drink water out of a glass. Uh, she has long lapses of attention, uh, which uh, appear to be hysterical in some sense. And of course, that is how later it will be called, a, a very complicated case of hysteria. Now, Breuer, more or less by accident, comes upon uh, the way of dealing with and disposing of these symptoms. He does so by asking her, or she in a way suggests this to him, um, and her share in the cure is very important, that that should all be talked out. So that whenever a symptom is mentioned, that she should see if she could remember what this reminded her of. This becomes then the famous talking cure. At first, Freud talked to his patients while they were in a hypnotic state. He believed hysterical symptoms were related to painful events from childhood. He thought that if his patients could remember and talk about the first time they experienced their symptoms, they would be relieved of their suffering. Gradually, he abandoned the use of hypnosis. In one of his most well-known cases, Fraulein Elizabeth von R., Freud wrote about the method he used to help patients recall their earliest memories. I made her lie down and keep her eyes shut. Throughout the analysis, I made use of the technique of bringing out pictures and the ideas by means of pressing on the patient's head. When I pressed her head, she would maintain that nothing occurred to her. I would repeat my pressure, but still nothing appeared. Perhaps I said she had not been sufficiently attentive, or perhaps her idea was not the right one. This, I told her, was not her affair. She was under an obligation to remain completely objective and say whatever came into her head whether it was appropriate or not. Freud began working with a technique he called free association, encouraging his patients to talk freely without interruption or suggestion. Freud was a famous observer and a fine listener. Listening became for him the crucial art. It was not just something passive like not talking. It was the kind of not talking that was in some very important way productive and meant the storing up in the mind of relevant material that could then be used later and brought to bear when the time was ripe. This was a matter of, of tact. So there's a good deal of art to psychoanalysis as he saw it. But above all, beyond the art, he always himself certainly believed, and I'm willing, by the way, to go along with him on this, that he was really a scientist, and a scientist of the mind, and he was working towards and understanding how people work, not just how his patients work. In 1895, Breuer and Freud published their findings in Studies on Hysteria. Freud detailed the case histories of six patients and outlined for the first time the techniques that would become the foundation of psychoanalysis. These included free association and transference the process in which a patient transfers feelings from previous relationships onto the relationship with the analyst. But within a year, Freud announced another major discovery, his seduction theory. He claimed that hysteria was caused by sexual abuses or seductions that took place in childhood. He based this new theory on the testimony of his patients. Freud was essentially 
treating his patients, trying to do two things which were separate, but he hoped not incompatible. On the one hand, he was trying to cure or at least uh, reduce the strain of the neurotic problems with which they had come. It is simply, uh, in that sense, it's a therapy like others, but he thought better than others. And secondly, he was using his patients as guinea pigs. Um, that is to say, they were part of the laboratory. I, I think of his consulting room as his one and only laboratory. The seduction theory was not well received by Freud's medical and academic colleagues. They rejected his conclusions. Even Breuer broke with him. Freud retreated into a period of intellectual isolation. During that time, he shared his ideas mainly with one person, a friend and colleague, Wilhelm Fleiss. Fleiss was a physician in Berlin. During the 15-year period of their friendship, they corresponded almost weekly, sharing personal and professional ambitions. Freud confided to Fleiss that he had a grand vision to create a universal theory of the mind from his understanding of abnormal behavior. He wrote to Fleiss his project for a scientific psychology. Frank Soloway is a historian of science at Harvard University. He believes that the project shows how important Freud's scientific aspirations were in formulating his theories. The project was Freud's uh, tremendously ambitious uh, attempt to reduce the workings of the mind to basic notions of natural science. And in Freud's day, this included a, a, a reliance upon the, uh, the neuron theory, which was just then emerging, and the notion that you could explain mental activity by exp explanations involving movements of energy between neurons within the brain or between various cellular elements. And Freud concocted, and I think you have to use the word uh, concocted, the most incredibly ingenious and imaginative scheme for explaining virtually uh, every kind of mental activity from thought to judgment to uh, problems dear to his heart in psychopathology, such as repression and various forms of neurosis, hysterical attacks. Freud soon abandoned the project, but the movement of energy through the body and the mind, especially sexual energy, remained a key Freudian motif. It's very important to appreciate why Freud was so fanatical about sex as a cause of neurosis. Why did he pick sex? He could have picked lots of things. Uh, uh, it's not just the, uh, the repression that, let's say, sex uh, was undergoing in the Victorian period. Sex was much more important to Freud. Sex was a biochemical phenomenon. It was a physiological phenomenon. And for somebody who's looking for a theory of the mind that can be based upon a natural science foundation, sex is crucial. It provides what Freud one call, once called the indispensable organic foundation, which must underlie all forms of disease. So for Freud, uh, sex was a plausible natural science form of, of, of pathology. And it takes on its importance in Freudian theory precisely because of that link to biology and to natural science. The freud fleece correspondence indicates that sexuality did become the central concept in Freud's thinking. But one critic, Jeffrey Mason, who translated the letters, believes they also reveal Freud's willingness to explore with Fleece some extreme sexual notions. What so fascinated me in reading the letters was the degree of Freud's involvement with Fleece. In the beginning, they seemed to have found one another in this vast scientific desert, two men who could think the same way, could think alike. And they Fleece developed a series of rather strange, even bizarre notions about the relationship between the female genitalia and the nose, what he called the nasal reflex neurosis, namely the things that happened in the genitals were reflected in the nose, and he felt that he sometimes had to intervene with surgery. And Freud, for a very long period, believed in this, accepted Fleece's ideas, and felt, in fact, that they were really in harmony with his own. Now, I think, in retrospect, we would say that they were not in harmony, and Freud, no doubt, some years later, would have recognized this himself. But for a period of time, Fleece was enormously influential. Freudian scholars are aware of the controversial aspects of Freud's relationship to Fleece, but most analysts, like Dr. Harold Blum, value the letters as an important record of the evolution of Freud's major ideas. <laughs> 
The Freud Fleece letters are now part of a large collection at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The Freud Fleece correspondence is of extraordinary importance as a record of the first self-analysis ever accomplished. Freud's self-analysis was a systematic self-exploration begun in October 1896 after the death of his father. Uh, and he proceeded to accomplish what no one had ever done before, to analyze himself so that he was both doctor and patient, although Fleece served as a confidant and as a kind of proto-analyst, and Freud was reporting the results of his analytic discoveries to Fleece in these very letters. At that period, dreams provided the greatest insights for him. Uh, and he proceeded in a very systematic way to regularly analyze himself on a daily basis, uh, making a record, writing down his dreams, and proceeding to analyze them. By writing down his dreams and free associating, Freud recalled events from his youth. He related in a letter to Fleece the important details of his self-analysis. He had discovered intense feelings of love for his mother, jealousy and hatred for his father, what he will later call the Oedipus complex. Freud believed that dreams provided access to a deeper understanding of behavior. I found the dream represented a particular state of affairs as I should have wished it to be. Thus the content of a dream was the fulfillment of a wish and its motive was a wish. If we adopt the method of interpreting dreams, we shall find that dreams really have a meaning. Freud concluded that dreams revealed sexual and aggressive wishes from childhood. He published this radical new vision in 1900 in Interpretation of Dreams, what he called his most original work. He felt he had come upon a universal truth, the idea of infantile sexuality, that everyone was sexual from birth. He decided to ask the patients to do with dreams what he had asked them to do in connection with their symptoms, namely, to discuss each element or to see what came to their mind if they permitted themselves to speak freely and without criticism of their thoughts. In this way, he began to see that dreams expressed a wish from childhood, usually a sexual wish, but did not express it directly, but in a disguised and distorted way. When he described some of his interpretations of dreams to his good friend and colleague, Wilhelm Fleece. Fleece said to him that the interpretation sounded like jokes and bad ones at that. Far from being offended, what Freud did was to take the idea seriously and to investigate what was it that brought the pleasure from jokes. Freud wanted to demonstrate that psychoanalysis had applications beyond its use as a treatment for neuroses that it was the key to the workings of the mind. In rapid succession, Freud published Jokes and Their Relationship to the Unconscious and Psychopathology of Everyday Life, in which he described how slips of the tongue or forgetfulness revealed conflicts about hidden thoughts or feelings. Freud now saw the mind divided into three areas. The unconscious, the place of sexual and aggressive wishes, urges, memories, and fantasies, the pre-conscious, a gatekeeper that permitted or prevented wishes from entering consciousness, and the conscious mind, the seat of awareness. Freud believed that when unconscious wishes were in conflict, or when blocked by the pre-conscious, they came out anyway as slips of the tongue, dreams, or as neurotic symptoms. I think Freud really believed that he had come upon certain insights about the nature of the mind, the way the mind works, that he regarded as remarkable and quite original, although he was very well aware that there were other psychologists, philosophers, poets, uh, novelists, who had come upon ideas that he himself had, as he said, laboriously had to find through his own laboratory, the patients on the couch. Freud considered dreams, infantile sexuality, and the unconscious to be his great ideas. He said, the poets and philosophers before me discovered the unconscious, but I have discovered the scientific means by which it can be studied.
but most of the scientific community in Vienna found his ideas to be peculiar and extreme. Freud's notion of the unconscious is, is a very uh, uniquely Freudian one. It, it supposes that there's actually a sort of an area of the mind that gets sealed off in the course of human development within which uh, uh, tempestuous uh, and instincts uh, are struggling for release but can't find proper release owing to this phenomenon of having been sealed off. And that's the unconscious mind. Uh, it's a very animal-like um, unconscious. Uh, it has um, uh, all of these uh, wild and tempestuous um, instincts inside of it. And when we speak of an unconscious behavior, that's a different sense of the word than Freud thought. Freud's was a very dynamic unconscious, and it's one that is uh, uh, much more plausible in the context of biological notions of his day, that that unconscious was our animal evolutionary past for Freud. And in that animal evolutionary past are things that are incompatible with modern civilization. But there's no way to escape it because we are forced to inherit all of these things from the past and to repeat them. So Freud's unconscious is alive, powerful, sealed off, and dangerous. And it's part of a 19th century thinking about the organism and evolution. In 1905, Freud published three essays on the theory of sexuality, linking what he had named the psychosexual stages of development, oral, anal, phallic, and genital, to personality traits. The public was outraged by his use of sexual language in reference to children. Privately, Freud admitted to Fleece that his new ideas on sexuality had serious implications for his original seduction theory about the cause of hysteria. He wrote to Fleece that he had been mistaken. He now believed that what his patients had described as sexual abuse was really fantasy the result of childhood wishes. This change in Freud's thinking has become one of the hotspots in Freudian scholarship. In 1984, Jeffrey Mason published this book. He charged that Freud abandoned his seduction theory not because of new evidence provided by his work with patients, but because of other pressures. What became clear to me as I was reading these letters was that there were pressures on Freud that were of a non-scientific nature. For example, the response from his medical and scientific colleagues was a very negative one. They refused to believe with Freud that these events could possibly take place. And he was quite sensitive to this. Remember, he was a young physician. He was just beginning his medical and psychiatric practice. It was important for him in order to have referrals and to have the kind of respect to become a member of the scientific community and of the university scientific community to persuade his colleagues that he had something new to offer. And they were rejecting his ideas about seduction. The abandonment of the seduction theory, like every other change that Freud made, was based on the analysis of his findings. He was constantly re-examining his material and his ideas and correlating theory and findings. This, of course, is the method of science. At first, in the situation and at the time that he was working, he believed the stories that his patients told him of their having been seduced by some older person who had already matured sexually and that these were the basis of the traumatic memories that caused hysteria. It was natural for Freud to take these stories at face value because at that particular time, it was believed that the sexual life of the individual began with puberty. Nonetheless, Freud's patients were telling him that they had sexual fantasies, sexual wishes during childhood. However, could he explain this, except with the idea that something must have happened to stimulate these individuals, these patients, prematurely into sexuality, that is, the result of some kind of seduction? Why really should we care about something that seems like a rather remote historical question? Well, I think the answer is because analysts from the time of Freud on, were convinced that Freud gave up the seduction hypothesis for purely scientific reasons. And once they believed this, his ideas became really doctrine within psychoanalysis and then spread to psychology and to psychiatry in general. 
so that his views about reality versus fantasy came to play an enormous role in our society. And they have been taken over from psychiatry and psychology more or less into the general population so that we see this even in the judicial system when a woman is talking about rape or when a child is talking about having been abused, the first tendency is to believe that this may be nothing more than a fantasy. And ultimately, that derives from Freud. Many of the controversies surrounding Freud have centered on the question of whether psychoanalysis is a science. Freud himself thought it had broader applications. In the years following his major publications on childhood sexuality, Freud applied psychoanalytic principles to religion, history, literature, and anthropology. He also had created a new model of the mind, the id, ego, and superego. These three forces represented the interplay of passion, rationality, and moral judgment. His ideas were so powerful that many intellectuals were drawn to psychoanalysis as a way to understand larger social and philosophical questions. War and peace, love and hate, religion and morality. Freud often spent his summers in the country outside of Vienna. He found comfort in spending time with his wife, their six children, and a loyal group of friends, including Princess Marie Bonaparte of Greece, whom Freud had analyzed. Initially, a small group of adventurous followers gathered around him, some famous, some not. But they attracted attention to Freud and the new field of psychoanalysis. Freud was for, let's say, the first 10 years of uh, psychoanalytic practice, let us say from the middle 1890s to 1905, 1906, anything but famous. He may have exaggerated a little bit how isolated he was. He had admirers by 1906, 1907. There were, in fact, even some rather uh, distinguished professional admirers. By 1911, an international association of analysts had grown up around Freud. Psychoanalysis was largely rejected by the traditional scientific community. These early analysts saw themselves at the forefront of a new intellectual movement, and they banded together against a hostile outside world. But there was also dissent within the group. Carl Jung, one of Freud's most ardent admirers, claimed that Freud had overemphasized the importance of childhood sexuality. And later, Karen Horney, another analyst, would charge that Freud had grossly misunderstood female psychology, a charge that was echoed throughout the coming years. World War I became a turning point in the history of psychoanalysis. Overnight, it gained wider credibility. Techniques derived from psychoanalysis were thought to be useful in treating soldiers who had been shell-shocked in battle. After World War I, European interest in Freudian methods grew. In Berlin, the first training institute was opened. In Vienna, a psychoanalytic clinic was started by members of the Vienna Society. These institutes were essential to the growth of psychoanalysis, but Frank Soloway contends there was a price to be paid. Freud and his followers um, made a very, uh, took a very crucial step in the um, uh, 1920s, uh, approximately, when they decided to have their own institutes for training and given uh, hostility to psychoanalysis within the universities to establish their own centers of learning and of, of training outside of universities. This essentially removed psychoanalysis from a 2,000-year tradition of, of, of criticism and growth of knowledge. And I think for Freud, it was a short-term gain. Psychoanalysis proliferated with its own teaching mechanisms, but it was a long-term disaster, I think. The 1920s were an exciting time for psychoanalysis. Many analysts, like Franz Alexander of the Berlin Institute, would eventually leave Europe and spread psychoanalysis to America. A. A. Brill, an American analyst, had translated most of Freud's work into English. Ernest Jones, Freud's biographer, would help found the American Psychoanalytic Association. In Europe, psychoanalysis generally remained outside the medical and academic establishments, but in America, it would be different. 
the American reception and interpretation of Freud was a very optimistic reception and interpretation. American analysts often believed that they could cure the most severe of, of neuroses, even psychoses, uh, uh, that they could treat, for example, schizophrenics. This was something that Freud had never felt. Uh, there was something about uh, psychoanalysis that suggested to Americans as representatives of a, of a new nation, of a frontier nation, uh, a wonderful buoyant optimism about the mind and, and the kinds of things that doctors could do for the mind. The press played a role in popularizing psychoanalysis, sometimes in a sensational way. By the 1930s, most Americans were at least familiar with Freud and his new psychology. The magazines were interested in this sensational figure. There he was, this uh, bearded Viennese doctor talking about sex all the time, so it seemed, uh, encouraging promiscuity. He seemed to be just perfect for the uh, the 1920s and uh, the age of Fitzgerald and so on. Uh, that this, of course, had nothing to do with the austerity of this doctrine was something that didn't bother the, the weeklies uh, or even the newspapers at all. Everybody was reading books about the uh, psychoanalysis and trying to understand their own problems in this uh, way by concentrating themselves uh, on uh, psychoanalytic techniques. It was very well suited uh, to the uh, demands of private practice. A uh, psychiatrist would uh, only need to have a hotel room to practice in, and there seemed to be an endless demand for uh, services uh, for psychoanalytic uh, treatment. May I have your last name? During World War II, American Army psychiatrists used a modified form of psychoanalysis in combination with other techniques to treat soldiers. In the 40s and 50s, there was an increased interest in psychotherapies or talking therapies which were based in psychoanalytic theory. Now, I notice in this uh, history here that you saw a vision of your brother. What, uh, tell me something about that. What, what happened? Oh, I, I guess it was a dream. Well, describe the dream. What, what did you see in the dream? I, I dreamt that I was home. My brother was home. After the war, it was considered prestigious for psychiatrists to enhance their medical education with six to ten years of additional training at an analytic institute. Can you tell me what brought you here? This introductory training film was made in 1962 by analysts from the Chicago Institute to demonstrate the proper methods of working with patients. I don't know whether I need to be here or not. As a matter of fact, I... Well, I... I've had a little trouble with jobs, but um, that's about all. Just chill. Analysts were taught the techniques of free association and transference. These techniques continued to distinguish psychoanalysis and analytically based therapies from the growing number of other talking therapies. Analysts believe, as did Freud, that an individual develops complex patterns of behavior early in life and that these patterns inevitably surface in the analysis through the process of transference. I get this feeling lately that you're critical of me, that you're, that you're hounding me, that you're, that you're down on me about something. So what did I do that was so bad? I don't know what brings this on. Over and over the same trouble. Now you. I don't know how to handle situations like this. I'm just stumped. I've been thinking maybe I better clear out. Maybe I ought to, you and I ought to call this thing quits. And uh, Just like the jobs. Just like my old man. I just had to get out of the family and forget about it. And During the 1950s and 60s, psychoanalysis was considered by many to be the preferred form of treatment for people with emotional problems. But it was expensive and lengthy. It required four to five sessions a week for at least two years. And even during a period of relative success, psychoanalysis was under attack. In 1952, an article appeared stating that the outcome for a patient undergoing analysis was no better than that of someone who had received no therapy. The article by the British behavioral psychologist Hans Eysenck was later refuted. But criticism like this challenged psychoanalysis to demonstrate its effectiveness 
through controlled scientific studies. For Freud, his patients confirmed his ideas. They provided him with the material to develop the theory of psychoanalysis, and what his patients revealed in their sessions proved its validity. Although Freud saw hundreds of patients, he only wrote extensive case histories on 12 of them. These 12 cases and the case study method became the foundation of psychoanalytic training. Today, many analysts still consider the case study method sufficient proof. Freud's standard of proof was the, the conclusions that he could draw from the data that he got within the analytic situation while he was treating patients. This is the investigative tool of psychoanalysis. There is no way of drawing conclusions about psychoanalytic uh, hypotheses if you leave out the data that you get from the analytic situation. They're not proving anything by listening to patients uh, confirm their expectations. This isn't proof we're testing in, in a rigorous way. Psychoanalysis needs to get itself back into um, settings where it can be tested in experimental and extraclinical ways. It needs to take a hard look at areas of the theory that have been problematical, and it needs to, uh, it needs to go on. And I think it, the hardest thing is for the analysts themselves to do this. They don't have the kind of training or background um, to to treat psychoanalysis as the kind of natural science it once was. I think in part the attitude towards experiment, uh, experimentation, this negative attitude, was, if the word fault is correct, Freud's own fault. But one might argue that the continuation of this attitude, to the extent that it persists, is the responsibility of those who don't cut themselves loose from Freud simply on the grounds that Freud himself had said this, and that's good enough for them. And we all know that that's not what we, would be called a scientific attitude, for sure. The program committee has made exactly Although psychoanalysis was the original form of psychotherapy, it is among the least practiced today. The American Psychoanalytic Association, with its membership of 2,500, is small compared to the number of mental health professionals in this country. There is intense pressure on this community to prove the effectiveness of psychoanalysis. But providing proof is difficult. The length and private nature of the process do not lend themselves easily to scientific scrutiny. How then should psychoanalysis be assessed today? There are many differing views, including those held by critics who are themselves analysts. Dr. Thomas Zaz. Well, what Freud developed, what he contended that he developed, were really two interlocking systems. One, a theory of human behavior, both normal and abnormal, and a system of therapy of treating, relieving mental diseases. Now, he felt that these were mutually confirmatory. In my view, so-called psychonic theory does not really qualify at all as a scientific theory because it is more like a Weltanschauung, an ideology of how human beings should be and should behave. Now, that is legitimate, but it's not science. That's a an ideology is perhaps the best modern word for this. It's a secular religion. Now, the therapy, again, unless one believes that there is an illness which is being treated, is not a therapy, but is a way of helping people. And the two actually are really quite separate. It is quite possible to accept a great deal, I think, of the therapeutic ideas and methods and reject virtually all of the theory, which is my position. The body of scientific evidence to support Freudian theory is so far small and inconclusive. At the Yale Child Study Center in New Haven, researchers are exploring aspects of Freudian theory by observing young children. The study focuses on four to six-year-olds, the age Freud called the most critical phase of development, the Oedipal stage. These researchers acknowledge the importance of many factors in the growth of the child, but like Freud, they see sexual conflict as a key factor, conflict having to do with children's sexual identity and feelings toward their parents. The sessions are videotaped to be studied later. He has little pants. It's actually a girl with a short haircut. Oh. 
He puts it down. He puts it down on the face. Mm -hmm. Like a dress with a pants. Uh-huh. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> Have you? Yes. The research team studies the tapes, looking for the language patterns, the interactions the child has with her analyst, and themes in her play. They believe these act as clues to understanding a child's inner feelings, especially relating to sexual identity. She's working out, uh, is it a boy, is it a girl, and she says at first that it's, it's a boy. She then takes the pants down and says, no, it's a girl, and she's able to, uh, to deal with the incongruity by saying, well, it's a, it's a girl with short hair and pants. Um, and I think that, you know, this, the curiosity and perhaps some of the conflict that, that one sees in children at this age is something that, that she's working on it at, at this moment in the play. Playing doctor. The methods of this study depend on observation and interpretation by the researchers, most of whom are analysts. The study may be useful in expanding upon Freud's ideas, but it does not meet the rigorous demands of the scientific method. Other researchers are conducting controlled experiments, and the evidence provided by these studies has moved the field of child development beyond Freud. Dr. Jerome Kagan. Freud was perhaps the boldest theorist we've had in psychology. He believed strongly that the major determinants of the child's normal growth and pathological growth could be fixed to certain experiences in the opening years of life. But he ignored the maturational changes that are occurring in the child's central nervous system that permit new mental or intellectual abilities, and those in turn permit the child to relate him or herself to the parents and to the outside world. And that, it seems to me, was the mistake that he made in the rest of his theorizing by trying to make sexual energy, sexual conflict, sexual anxiety the key central primary cause of both normal and pathological development. Dr. Kagan and his colleagues at Harvard University believe that early experience is important in the development of the individual. But they also believe that the genetic makeup of the child can be a contributor to the development of personality traits. The researchers here use observational methods along with other experimental techniques, to gather information about a child's predisposition to certain emotions, like boldness, shyness, and in this case, anxiety. These tests are designed to meet the criteria of the experimental method. They have control groups, are repeatable, and provide data from which researchers can predict behavior. Advances in the field of psychology and biology are now beginning to answer some of the same questions posed by Freud almost 100 years ago. In England, a Nobel laureate and one of the scientists who discovered the structure of DNA, Dr. Francis Crick, has turned his attention to the study of the brain, including memory and dreams. How does he assess Freud? Freud was a very strange case because he started off being interested in the physiology of the brain and wanting to try to relate that physiology to psychology. And he wrote an essay on this, his so-called project. What we know is that the ideas he had about physiology were really wrong. When you look at the ideas, they don't seem very plausible, at least not to me, but uh, they seem to be based on an old-fashioned idea of the mind, and so on, which people interested in information processing, as I do, would regard as rather naive and heavily cultured, culturally determined, let's put it that way, which, of course, was why they, they had such a great appeal. Mind you, he did have insights. He did make people realize a lot of their behavior, the motives for their behavior wasn't what they thought they were. He did make it clear that people were more influenced by sexual reasons than they, in the 19th century, they were prepared to admit. Maybe it's different nowadays, and so on, and a lot of other things of that sort. But if you ask in strict scientific terms, I'd be very surprised if much of it survives. Freud thought uh, that dreams were wish fulfillment. He thought that was his great idea. But when you read his account,
and how he had to twist things to fit the theory, um, it's very difficult to accept this. And I'm not sure that all Freudians now accept that key idea of his. Uh, and then, of course, he had other aspects of dreams and so on, which are more complex. And we would feel those all that's all too fancy, that it's all too easy to interpret dreams without having any check on what the interpretation is. So we're inclined to leave all that on one side and say, that's for the future. We understand so little of the brain at the moment, it's really a waste of time inventing all these things. People love to do it, but in the past they liked to believe that dreams foretold the future. Very few people believe that now, but they like to think there's some deep significance in their dreams. We would think it's just an accidental byproduct uh, produced by from what random waves and so on, and you shouldn't read too much into it. I agree with many of the most prominent uh, natural scientists, biologists, and philosophers of science who have contended that psychoanalysis is not a science, has nothing to do with science, it is an ideology. And it is, of course, significant not for it being a science or for its impact on science, which I think is nil, but as a cultural phenomenon, as a historical phenomenon. It's obvious that psychoanalysis and Freud, and here one really should compare him to someone like Marx or other religious figures, had a tremendous impact on how we live today. The issue really is one of names here, which I think is not uh, where we should stay. Uh, is it a science or not? The question really is this. Are the assertions made by psychoanalysts, either the global ones, such as the development of a child through various stages, or the more uh, the narrow ones, namely the interpretations that a, an analyst makes during the hour, are they in any sense reliable? Or are they just uh, ad hoc assertions that you could uh, read about in a novel and uh, agree because they're well stated or disagree because they're not well stated? And I would think that what would have to suggest is that the kind of organized discipline or science that psychoanalysis claims to be, and I think with justice, is one in which proof and disproof are extremely difficult given the nature of the material, but that any other psychology dealing with fundamental human mental realities faces the same problem. In 1936, Freud celebrated his golden wedding anniversary with his wife, Martha. They were surrounded by friends and a family that now included many grandchildren. But this was one of the last celebrations Freud was to hold near his home in Vienna. In 1938, when the Nazis invaded Austria, he fled to England. In London, Freud was a celebrity. He was honored by the Royal Society. They asked him to sign the official charter book in which his name would appear with the signatures of Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. He was considered for a Nobel Prize several times, but was never chosen. The award he valued most was the Goethe Prize, given not for his scientific contribution, but for his literary achievements. Freud had become the most famous psychologist in the world but he never achieved the full acceptance of the scientific community. These films are among the last taken of Freud. This was the occasion of his 83rd birthday. He was quite frail, exhausted from a 16-year battle with cancer. He died at his home on September 23, 1939. In one of the only recordings of his voice, Freud summarized his life's work. I started as a neurologist trying to break relief to my neurotic patient. I discovered some important new facts about the unconscious, the role of instinctual urges, and so on. Out of these findings, through a new science, psychoanalysis, a part of psychology, as a new method of treatment of the neurosis. I had to pay heavily for this bit of good luck. People 
does not believe in my facts and thought, my theories, unsavory. Resistance was strong and unrelenting. In the end, I succeeded, but the struggle is not yet over. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to NOVA, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Please be sure to include the show title. To purchase film or video copies of this program for educational use, call toll-free 1-800-621-2131. In Illinois or Alaska, call Collect, 312-940-1260. This program was produced by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for NOVA is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. And by Allied Signal, a technology leader in aerospace, electronics, automotive products, and engineered materials. and the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide.